Well, hello, good evening and uh, welcome to LICC and welcome to our session this evening on building kingdom culture lessons from a six billion dollar company. And uh, welcome to our Northwood studio, otherwise known as my home. And as some of you know, I don't have any cute young little children to interrupt proceedings and win your hearts, but we do have a fluffy dog with a sonic boom of a bark. But as some of you know, he only uses it for intruders and heretics. So once again, we could have another noisy evening um, on the call. My name is Mark Green and I'm an ICC's mission champion. And over the years, I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about how to create distinctive kingdom cultures in the teams I've been in and in the diverse organisations that people who come on our courses work in. So it's an absolute treat to have Al Erisman with us, who's got so much wisdom and expertise to offer us this evening. Well, I wonder what kind of uh, culture helps organisations and the people in them flourish and how can we make a contribution to contribute to those kinds of cultures in our organisations? It's an issue, as many of you know, that's become increasingly studied as organisational leaders in the business, public and third sectors have recognised the power of a positive culture to attract new talent, to retain the best people, to decrease absenteeism, to decrease the cost of recruitment, to decrease the loss of organisational knowledge and the dilution of organisational culture and thereby contribute to increased productivity and profit and general well-being. Of course, biblically, God's concern to create a working context conducive to human flourishing goes right back to Genesis 1. Indeed, by the time we see God creating the foot, we didn't see him, but by the time God does create the first humans to work and steward the garden, he's made everything ready for them, hasn't he? There's air to breathe, there's ground to stand on, there's running water to drink from, there's food to delight the eye and thrill the palate and nourish the body. There are animals to care for and to name, there's good work to be done. So what has God done? He has created a context for human flourishing with him. So God, who is love, out of his love, creates a context for human flourishing. That's his goal. And that, even after the fall, remains his desire for us all. As he says to the exiles in Babylon in Jeremiah 29, 7, seek the shalom of the city. That is, seek the relational, economic, political, ecological, well-being, wholeness of the city and pray for it. For if it prospers, you too will prosper. And notice that, that twin command, seek shalom, that is take initiative to bring it about, pray for shalom, that is to seek God's priorities, his wisdom, his empowering and blessing for it. And that is our call. This is one of the ways we fulfill God's covenant promise with Abraham, that we might be a blessing to others. May indeed his will be done in our organisations as in heaven. But do we as followers of Christ really have something to offer the organisations that we are part of? Well, I have no doubt that we do, not least um, because there are several people on the call tonight, other than now, who've done it in the organisations they've been part of, in health and safety, in infrastructure provision, in healthcare, in banking, in a brilliant bakery in Burnley. But uh, tonight, to help us explore what that might look like in the places we're involved in, we have both a skilled practitioner of the art and a studier of the best of it. Al Erisman, who joins us from his Seattle studio. Al is a, actually Dr. Al and has a PhD in applied mathematics. And that uh, expertise took him to Boeing for 32 years. And for the last 10, he was director of R&D for computing and mathematics. He was managing a staff of around 300 scientists. I rather like that his bio says between 250 and 300 scientists as if he couldn't count, but hey. Anyway, there were mathematicians, statisticians and engineers with the objective of bringing new technology to Boeing's processes and products. I was also the executive in residence and the past director for the Center of Integrity in Business in the School of Business and Economics at Seattle Pacific University. And more broadly, as uh, some of you do know and have been sat at his feet, he is one of the pioneers of the faith and work movement in the United States. And he was one of the four prime movers that led to the faith and work uh, summits, where I think we first met Al and which brought together leading practitioners and thinkers from the workplace, theological educators 
and pastoral ministers, a brilliant concept. He's uh, written a number of technical papers with titles that I don't understand, and three books with titles I do. The Service Master Story, Navigating the Tension Between People and Profit, and we'll hear some of the lessons from that tonight. And before that, uh, a book on Joseph, which I've also read called The Accidental Executive. Well, I'll, uh, I have to say on this topic, there is absolutely nothing accidental about our invitation to ask you to address us on this topic this evening. Uh, but before we do, can I just ask you uh, a couple of questions? So, um, Al, when, when you began working uh, at Boeing, which is a while back now, work, workplace ministry uh, wasn't really on the agenda at all, was it, in the US church in the way it is today? So how did you come to, to realize uh, work's importance to God? For me, Mark, it uh, happened rather suddenly. Um, I was on my way to work. I can still remember where I was on the uh, driving. I was listening to the radio and I heard a man interviewed. His name was Wayne Alderson. He had been vice president of a steel company and he talked on that show about how he felt God had called him to be there. And I thought, huh, that's a little different than the way I've been thinking about it. I wonder what that means for me. And so uh, that evening on the way home, I bought a book by R.C. Sproul on, his, uh, on the life of Wayne Alderson. It was called Stronger Than Steel. I read it all the way through after dinner. The next morning I called Wayne and we became friends until he died in 2014. And during that period, uh, I have been working on what it meant while I was at Boeing, what it meant in a broader sense, what the scripture has to say about it. And I would say I'm still trying to figure it out, Mark, but uh, I, I am deeply committed to this idea that God cares about every aspect of our work. So, Ella, I know you've got lots of stories, but um, I wonder, um, could you tell us just, just one for now about how you saw um, God at work at Boeing? Yeah, you know, I, I do have lots and, and I'll, uh, I mean, I would love to tell about some times when we had some technical breakthroughs and it was like God shining through uh, in a, the middle of this, of this work. But I'll tell you about another incident. There, there was a man at the company that I helped. I helped him get a promotion. I helped him go off to a university for some training. And when he came back to the, uh, to the company, he was put in a new position as my boss. And his first act was to demote me. It was a painful time at the company. Uh, I can, I'll, I'll not forget it. We wrestled with, is God telling us we ought to do something else? Should I take a different position? Uh, what, what really is God saying? Over a period of about nine months, it finally came to me that God had called me where I was and I should stay and work it out. And one day, the whole organization changed. My boss, his boss, his boss were all fired. And there, were, uh, there was a new way of doing things. The new leader was a man who I'd known early in my career. And I set up a meeting with him. But on Sunday, before the meeting, I was at church and I heard a, uh, a sermon on the life of Joseph. How he had sent a message out when he was in prison that he didn't belong there. But at the same time, how he had worked very hard. So I went into this meeting with this man. <laughs> I don't advise anyone to do this, but I did. And I said, um, on Sunday, I was at church and I heard a sermon on Joseph. I learned two things. One, it's okay to let people know that something is wrong. And Orv, I've been in prison for the last year and this is wrong. It, it shouldn't be. But two, we've worked very hard and I want to show you what we've done. At the end of that, he said, let me think about this and I'll get back to you. And he did a major reorganization that changed my life. It was like God was involved at both ends of the story. At the beginning, because I had some things to learn. And at the end, because of the opportunity. And it paralleled Joseph so completely that I couldn't get him out of my head. And so it, it really did uh, change my life. Lots of other stories, but that's kind of the big one. Well, certainly Boeing had some, 
had some years of plenty, even if they are having a hard time now. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, um, Paul, I'm delighted to um, that uh, our spanking new CEO, uh, Paul Willey, is going to uh, pray for us. So, Paul, would you would you do that? Definitely. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be with you this evening. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, so let's pause just at the outset of our event tonight. Um, let's reflect on words from Jesus in John chapter 18 and verse 36, where Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world, often mistranslated as my kingdom is not of this world, but the kingdom is very definitely for this world. So Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world, but it is of it. It is for it. Um, and so let us just reflect for a moment as we pause to pray on perhaps where we've seen God's kingdom in our world today, where we've seen God's kingdom break in. Let's just pause and reflect on that question for a moment. And so, Lord, we reflect on the fact that uh, though your kingdom is not from this world, how could it be given what our world is like? We thank you that it is for this world and your desire is that your kingdom should come and that we should seek to build our organizations and teams in ways that reflect the reality of what your kingdom looks like. Uh, we pray that you will speak to us this evening. We pray that you will equip us and we pray that you will affect change through us. We thank you for Al. Thank you for who he is. Thank you for his skills, for his experience, for his openness to you. Thank you for the way that you have been at work in him and through him. And so we pray that as he speaks to us this evening, you will speak through him to us and that something might change as a result of this interaction between us. We pray for your spirit to fill us and to give us minds and hearts that are receptive to you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Al, good evening. Good to see you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. I appreciate the kind in, uh, kind words and the wonderful prayer. In the early 1990s, Bill Pollard was chairman and CEO of the Service Master Company, and he was in London for some business meetings. The company managed plant services, housekeeping, and janitorial services for hospitals and businesses around the world and had taken on a, long, a large contract with the National Health Service the year before. After the usual management review, Bill said, I'd like to meet with some of the workers. And the meeting was quickly arranged. When he was introduced as the chairman and CEO of the Service Master Company, one of the workers, Nisha, came over and put her arms around him. She said, uh, as Bill relates the story, she gave me a big hug and thanked me for the training and tools she'd received to do her job. Then she showed me how she had uh, accomplished all these things in cleaning patients' rooms, providing a detailed before and after service master description. She was proud of her work and she knew that she was doing more than a cleaning task. She was a part of helping the patient get well. You would have thought she owned the company. Bill uh, loved that story because it captured something about the company. Most people think of the services business as simply low cost labor. But in the words of Harvard professor James Heskett, who did three case studies on the company, Service Master has cracked the code on the services industry by providing workers with a sense of purpose, meaning, and opportunity most had never experienced before. This evening, I wanna show you how they built this culture. And in the first part, I'll take us up to the year 2000. It's a good story by itself, but listen carefully to what it might mean for you and your work. 
whatever position you're in, perhaps there's something that will resonate with you. After the break, I'll complete the story and summarize some things this might tell us about running an organization post COVID. So to begin the story, I need to go back to 1929. That's when Marion Wade was working at a company and the Great Depression had started. Marion Wade went to his job as a salesman for a mothproofing company and found the doors of the business were locked. The company had gone out of business. Marion was a hustler. He had great skills and had made the best of many tough situations. He dropped out of school after year nine because he was more interested in sports. But now since he needed to make a living for his family, he decided he didn't need someone else's company to sell mothproofing products. He could do it himself. And that was the birth of what later would be named Service Master. He soon came to realize that the products he was selling actually didn't work. I remember he said one time, the only way you can kill a moth with a mothball is if you hit them over the head with it because they have no sense of smell. Through his network of acquaintances, he created an opportunity of working in a laboratory at Northwestern University, leading a research team. Remember, this is a year nine dropout from school, inventing a new product that became the foundation for the next phase of his company. His product involved heating a mixture of things and it really worked. His business began to grow. Soon there were several people in his business and later he invented a process for cleaning carpets in place. And that became another part of his growing business. A big shift came in 1944, 15 years after he'd started the company. Wade was working in a house in Evanston, Illinois doing mothproofing when the heated mixture blew up in his face. Doctors said he might be blind for the rest of his life. Wade was a Christian and figured God was trying to get a hold of him. So he listened. He called this his Damascus Road experience, wondering if God was calling him to leave his business and become a missionary or a pastor. But as he wrestled with this question, an answer came to him. Perhaps God was calling him to apply his Christian faith in his business. These worlds had always been separate for him. What would it look like? In and out of the hospital over the next year, his vision began to root as his physical vision returned. He started by refining the goals of the company and what success looked like. Listen to his definition of success. I was not asking for personal success as an individual or merely material success as a corporation. I don't equate that kind of success with Christianity. Whatever God wants is what I want. But I did try to build a business that would live longer than I would in the marketplace and that would be a witness to Jesus Christ in the way business was conducted. And then he added, I wanted to have men and later women working with me who would know what the Lord had done and was doing so that as the Lord was receiving me into his glory, I would be able to tell him his company was still working for him. The company took on a flagship statement to honor God in the marketplace. This meant among many other things, acting transparently and he became known for the statement, if you don't live it, you don't believe it. To make this dream a reality, he needed it, the company to grow and he set out looking for a person who could help him do just that. He set his eyes on a young man who he thought could fill this hole and his name was Ken Hansen. Ken didn't have the ordinary qualifications to lead a business. He had recently graduated from Wheaton College studying philosophy and theology and was working as an interim pastor. I'd love to ask Marion what he actually saw in Ken, but I think what he saw was the way he went about his business. He was a man of high integrity and he had an entrepreneurial spirit. He watched Ken welcome new people moving into the neighborhood 
And he, as he moved their boxes with them, he invited them to church and his church was growing. Ken, however, didn't really want to go into business. He wanted to be a missionary. And so he resisted at first, but then his son, Kenny was born with Down syndrome. He and his wife committed to having Kenny at home. And that meant he needed to stay in the area. And he joined this fledgling company. In spite of the strong foundation Marion had brought to the company, product invention, perseverance, ethics, clear understanding of purpose and goals, he recognized a talent for business in Ken that, as Marion said, God had not given me. <laughs> Ken was a natural business leader, and so Marion said to him, pay the employees as much as you can. If there's money left over, pay yourself. And if there's money after that, pay me. Ken's business leadership was remarkable. The first thing he did was incorporate the company for the first time and then create an office in Chicago. He named the company Wade Wenger and Associates. Wenger had been an investor and a supporter for the business. And I asked Hansen why his name wasn't there. And he said, well, it is. It's in the and Associates part. This was a mark of humility that characterized Ken Hansen, along with Marion Wade and others to follow. They were a good complementary match. Together, they developed something that they called shingles on a roof. Though Marion was the founder and president, Ken was a manager, they would work together in making the best use of each person's skills, not focusing on a title. Hansen's mark on the company became deeper. He opened a branch outside Chicago and Milwaukee. He started the franchise business. He developed a way of keeping track of the business aspects of the company using a telephone and a, slider, a slide rule to create a business dashboard long before we had the term. Ken was a man of action. At one time he said, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly to begin with. He did love excellence, but he didn't want to study things to, to death. He did make some mistakes along the way, but he continued to develop and grow this business. By 1957, Hansen was named president and Wade became chairman of the board. But Hansen recognized that Wade was a better salesperson and often brought him in to make presentations, but Hansen was better at closing the business. Shingles on the roof continued. To further develop the management team, Wade and Hansen hired a man with business training from another Chicago company. His name was Ken Wessner. He was also a graduate of Wheaton College. He again was a great fit for the company, fully committed to honoring God in his work from the foundation of his own Christian beliefs, but he brought attention to process, formalizing how the company did business. In 1962, Hansen made the call to take the company public, opening an opportunity for access to capital. Yet he recognized that as Christian leaders, they were exposing themselves to great pressure. We're for sale every day, Ken Hansen said, and that meant they had to work harder. At this point, the company had grown to a million in annual revenue, but Ken Hansen recognized he didn't have the skills to run a publicly traded company so he enrolled in 1962 in an MBA program on weekends at University of Chicago, getting an MBA in 1964. Ken Wessner's uh, influence was growing within the company as well. He formalized training programs. He created an R&D department in a services company, one of the very rare things that uh, uh, he did. It was also through Ken Westner that they formalized the structure of how they were gonna work with franchises. And Ken Westner developed the hospital business, beginning an outsourcing service for all the uh, plant maintenance, cleaning, uh, housekeeping services within a hospital and opened the first one of these in 1962. He is the one who had the doctors and nurses come and speak with the service people helping them to see that the work they did had purpose and meaning beyond the task. They were a part of helping the patient get well. Wessner also began 
international expansion, taking a lengthy trip to England in 1962 that ultimately led uh, to opening up this hospital business and later some of the other businesses in England and then in Japan. A very important thing that Ken Westner added to the mix was the formalization of the objectives and values of the company. They'd already been operating this way for many years, but Ken got them crystallized and then allowed people to study them and to talk about them. And they were to honor God in all we do, to help people develop, to pursue excellence, and to grow profitably. From that point on, every decision the company made went through the sieve of those four objectives. In 1973, Marion Wade died. He had, bit, he had realized his dream of seeing Service Master all over the world, and he had realized the opportunity of having this company stand for Jesus Christ. Ken Westner became the new CEO, Ken Hansen, the new chairman of the board. And at this point, the company is now at 70 million in revenue and had been profitable since growing, going public except for one year in 1970. And as it happened before, the two Kens worked like shingles on a roof. Early, Ken Westner faced a leadership decision. The company had decided they wanted to open in the Middle East and a natural candidate to lead this expansion in Jordan was a man named Bishar Mufti, a regional manager and a Muslim. In Westner's office, Ken asked Bishar, how would you deal with the four objectives there? And he replied, the company is built on these four objectives and they shape every decision we make. I know and believe the objectives. I know they're the soul of the company. I'll make decisions based on these. Westner said that's exactly what they needed. Ken Hansen about the same time made this comment. He said, we don't impose our faith on others, but we invite them into our faith and we demonstrate this through behaviors. Hansen said, I never hired someone because they were a Christian or didn't hire someone because they were not, but we had very clear expectations of everyone. In the mid 1970s, the two Kens realized they needed a new leader for the next phase of their company. And they decided to recruit a man named Bill Pollard. Bill was another Wheaton grad and they knew him through that connection. He was trained as a lawyer who had worked in Chicago as a lawyer and then opened a law firm in Wheaton and then he had taken a vice presidential assignment at Wheaton College to handle a major gift that they had been given, a coal mining company that had to be operated until they sold it off. And when that was wrapping up, Bill was considering going back into law practice and the two Kens invited him to consider an opportunity to join at Service Master with the idea that he could become CEO one day. Bill decided in the interview to see what would be required to get to that CEO position. And he began asking very specific questions in the interview. Five minutes into the interview, Ken Hansen stood up, looked Bill in the eye and said, the interview is over. And Bill was ushered out of the room. That evening, Bill received a phone call from Ken Hansen asking if he wanted to know what happened there. And Bill said, well, I assume you didn't want me. But Hansen said, it's more complicated than that. Meet me for breakfast at six in the morning. And he hung up the phone. Ken was pretty direct. Over breakfast the next morning, uh, Hansen said, you know, if you want to come for a title or position, we're not interested in you. But if you want to come to serve, you can have a wonderful opportunity at the company. We'd love to have you. Bill joined Service Master as Executive Vice President in September 1978, and he was promptly presented with his first work assignment, working as a janitor in a hospital for the first six weeks. 
Every morning he'd arrive at the hospital and put on a green suit and mop the floors. One morning he told me that uh, he had just put out his wet floor signs when a woman walked past him and said to him, aren't you Bill Pollard? Well, yes I am, Bill said. And she responded, didn't you used to be a lawyer? And Bill replied, well, I have a new job now. You see, Bill said that he learned about being a leader during that six week period. I knew something of the experience of our people. I learned about people doing the services work that made them generally invisible. I learned about how hard this work was and it shaped decisions we made as a company because of that experience. A second early assignment was a to accompany Ken Westner to Wall Street to help explain the company. Bill was given the task of explaining the four objectives one year after coming to the company. He loved to talk about the first objective because he said, this gave me the opportunity of confronting people with the question of God. So he explained the to honor God in all we do meant to have the very highest ethical standards, but it also meant to recognize that all people are worthy of being treated with dignity and respect. And in his language, because they are made in the image of God and that all work is important and has dignity, he could address this from a personal experience. Bill was named CEO in 1983. And by this time, the revenues of the company were $700 million. They had been profitable every year since 1970. But his tenure opened with the price of the stock dropping from 37 to 17. It wasn't just Wall Street's nervousness about the new leader, but a change in government policy restricted growth in hospitals and inhibited outsourcing. The market saw service masters growth coming to an end. But Bill and his new team got to work, expanding the work in hospitals to businesses, academic institutions, and then they began making acquisitions. The company had failed at acquisitions in, 19, in the 1960s, leading to one year of loss. But now there were pieces in place. There were processes and structures and, and ways of doing things. And they began to look for companies that engaged in service work where leadership might enable service people to see the importance of purpose and meaning in their work. Their first major acquisition was Terminex in 1986. And then they acquired Merry Maids, a home cleaning company in 1988. And then they acquired companies in plumbing and home inspection and furniture repair and lawn care. This created a brand new challenge, which was Bill Pollard's uh, job, taking over a company with a different culture. They had to retrain management and employees to see how business should be done in a different way. Bill had to teach about purpose and success, about business strength, about process control, all while holding on to the fundamental purpose of honoring God in all we do. He frequently said the first two objectives are end goals, to honor God and help people develop. And the others are means goals. We're excellent and we grow profitably in order to create po po possibilities for people and to honor God in what we do. He became known as the professor at the company because everywhere he went, he talked about these things. They set an objective of promoting 20% of the people to leadership. One Terminex leader told me he came back from his first corporate meeting very frustrated. What's all this talk about philosophy and God? We just want to make money. But they learned over time. Shingles on the Roof continued with Ken Westner and Ken Hansen, now Chairman Emeritus, as they continued working together to create their strengths. Throughout the 80s and the 90s, Service Master was recognized by Fortune magazine as a top services company in the world. The year 1994 was monumental for Service Master. It was the year both Ken Hansen and Ken Westner died. The company had reached $3 billion in revenue. Profit had grown every year since 1970. And Carlos Cantu, the former leader of Terminex and another Christian, was named the new CEO. 
Carlos brought his own strengths to the company. Another Christian, another follower of Jesus, born of Mexican immigrants, Carlos put a strong emphasis on diversity. His approach rooted in his own faith and shaped by an event at the time of the acquisition. You see, when they were acquiring Terminex, at the final stages of discussion back in 1986, Bill Pollard said to Carlos, I'd like to have a personal conversation with you one-on-one. -on -one. Carlos assumed this meant that Bill wanted to do a deeper dive into the financials. But Bill wanted to talk about management philosophy, the significance of God in the work and lives of the people, and the essence of the four objectives. Carlos resonated with these things completely, but he said interjecting thoughts into a discussion like this related to business acquisition was unexpected to say the least. At the time of the transition to Carlos, Bill shared this comment with him. I'm available for counsel, but you need to do what you see is, fist, is best. Don't try to please me. Let's work together. Acquisitions continued. Bill and Carlos embarked on a continuation of shingles on a roof, working together, though Carlos was clearly in charge. Patricia Asp, one of the early women executives at Service Master, became a real champion for Carlos, helping him to get out and be known at venues because he was not as well known as Bill. Bill had become recognized as not only the company leader, but its spiritual leader. And so she took Carlos around and became a big fan of Carlos Cantu. She later said, my time at Service Master changed me, not only for the opportunities it brought at work, but these four objectives shaped every aspect of my life. Early in 1998, a major change happened when Carlos was diagnosed with cancer. And it, he began a personal battle along with his mar marketplace battle and by mid-year 1999, it became clear that he would be unable to continue in leadership and needed to retire. Bill Pollard was announced as a new leader at Service Master in October of 1999. And the plan was to develop new leadership by the end of 2000. The turbulence led to the first time since 1970 that profits had not increased year over year although they continued substantially and the company reached $6 billion in revenue. Let me share some slides and summarize a few key points of the story that I've told you. I have told you the story of how this kingdom culture was shaped by five individuals. They were Marion Wade from 29 to 57, Ken Hansen from 57 to 73, Ken Wessner, 73 to 83, Bill Pollard to 93, and again at the end, and Carlos Cantu, 1994 to 1999. What they built in this company had, had happened layer after layer after layer. I see it as God's providence that they didn't start with business success, but they started with a business philosophy of purpose. What does success look like? What are the inventions that are necessary to make this company work? And then Ken Hansen could layer on the business structures and the finance and Ken Wessner, the process and training and opening up the hospital business. And then Bill Walt, uh, Pollard, growth through acquisitions and cultural infusion. And then Carlos Cantu continued that rooted expansion but brought a strong dimension of diversity into the mix. Those four objectives became a guidance for everything that they did. And if you look at them carefully, you begin to realize that they are sometimes in conflict. Sometimes it might be that to grow profitably, you might want to do something in a different way that didn't value a person. How do you hold on to things that are uh, in conflict with each other? The natural tendency is to give up on one and hold on to the other. But they attempted in every decision to say, let's hold on to all of these and let the tension between them drive creativity toward a solution that we never would have seen otherwise.
Ken Hansen illustrated this in a rather interesting way. He said, balancing objectives that are intention is like stretching an exercise band. When extended, you better not let go of either end or it will hit you in the face. So they struggled with how do you make a decision that creates, that comes from this tension and makes this work. Here's a picture of their revenue growth that I sketched for you. You can't see 1962 when it was only a million dollars on the scale of billion dollar increments, but they were at about $6 billion by the end of 2000. Their profit again could hardly be seen in those early 70s years, but it grew to almost $200 million by 1998 and then stepped back just a little bit during that turbulent time when Carlos had taken ill. The company had a caution though, and I wanna mention this thing that Bill Pollard said. He said, one shouldn't expect or promote financial success or gain from seeking to honor God. In other words, whenever people would say, well, you got all this success financially because you sought to honor God, he would say, be careful. You honor God because that's what is called on. That's what we are to do, not as a means of creating financial success. So that caution bill would raise numerous times in the interviews I did with him in doing this research. They were widely recognized. Financial Times in 1997 voted ServiceMaster one of the top 20 most admired companies in the world. Fortune Magazine throughout the 80s and the 90s rated them as the top service company in the world. The picture there is of um, Bill Pollard and Ken Wessner featured in one of the articles in Fortune Magazine. What does all this mean for you as a worker? Suppose you're not a CEO. Suppose you have a position maybe at the bottom of the organization, maybe running an organization or something else. You know, the first thing is every one of us, even if our management doesn't tell us this, we can seek out what is the bigger purpose in the work that we are doing. God has called us to this work. How do we see what it actually means for the kingdom of God? Secondly, every person is an image bearer of God. Think about that as you interact with your boss, with your coworkers, with your subordinates, with your colleagues, with your vendors. Every person is an image bearer of God. This level of respect changes those relationships. Third, ethics is important even when it hurts. I've outlined some of the cases, there are many more stories on how they made very hard decisions, but they did it because it was the right thing to do, letting God take care of the results that came from that. And finally, a reminder from Paul and Colossians, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for man. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I need to tell you the rest of the story for Service Master. It's harder to do because it isn't as positive, but I think we can learn something from it. So I'm gonna tell you what happened with Service Master after 2000, and then I wanna draw some lessons for what we can do in thinking about organizations post pandemic. First of all, 2000. In 2000, during that interim year, Bill Pollard outlined two different ways to approach dealing with the next generation of his company. Everything centered on maintaining the center of the company and the four objectives supported by servant leadership. The environment of business was tough at the time. Remember the dot-com boom? Any company that didn't have dot-com in their name was somehow old fashioned and Service Master was no exception. The company decided ultimately to bring in a much younger leader. The business community rejoiced at this. They said, finally, we got someone who's a modern management person and knows stuff about technology. But Jonathan Ward had no experience in the services business. Bill had outlined several possible ways the company could go forward, but Jonathan Ward went his own way. So several things changed pretty quickly. The first was that shingles on the roof stopped. Jonathan Ward wanted to be his own person. 
The second thing is the company headquarters were moved uh, to Memphis from the Chicago area where they had been for so many years. This was the home of Terminex. In the lobby of the corporate headquarters, the service master in Chicago was a huge statue, 11 feet tall, of uh, the disciple and Jesus at his feet, washing his feet. A reminder to everyone of what servant leadership was about. One newspaper clipping I came up across said, they've moved Jesus to Memphis. <laughs> it was a, more than a psychological pain for many. The hospital business, number three, was sold off because its profit margins were somewhat less. This is the area of the company that had the deepest roots around the four objectives. And when the hospital business was sold off, the research operation was closed as well. In an early press conference, Jonathan Ward said, make no mistake, the focus of our business is on maximizing shareholder value. And servant leadership disappeared at the top as well. One person that interviewed John Ward told me, he said it was just too hard. Longer term, some other things changed. In 2003, it was apparent that Bill Pollard didn't have the voice that he once had, and he resigned from the board, as did many other longtime leaders. In 2003, the company that was focusing on making money had its first loss since 1970. And then the second objective was moved to third with customers coming into the second spot. Now you might say, well, it's great for a company to focus on its customers, but remember, the customers were well served by people, workers who had purpose and meaning in what they did. And the shift made the employees a means by which that happened. Those interviewed said this had become a very different company. And by 2006, Jonathan Ward was terminated. The company was purchased by a private investment firm and was no longer publicly traded. Many of the acquired brands were sold off because there was no longer a reason to hold them together. Honoring workers had been downplayed. In 2013, Rob Gillette was brought in to take the company public again. And for the first time, a service master leader reached back to Bill Pollard and he said, what was it you did during those magic years? Because we don't have it anymore. But after a long discussion together, Rob said to me, reflecting on that, by this time we had a board that was interested in short-term profit and it was impossible to kind of rejuvenate the things that had been done before. He was terminated in 2017. Early in 2021, the eighth leader took over service to take over service master since 2001 seven leader five leaders from two, uh, 1929 to 2000 eight from 2000 to 2021 he sold off the remainder of service master to a private equity firm and the publicly traded company has become rebranded as terminex there remain vestiges within the old company of what happened before some leaders are seeking to do what they can to preserve those first two objectives. Some of the independently operated franchises for service master and merry maids that have a lot of uh, agency in the way they operate still have the four objectives. In researching this book, I went into the Seattle chapter and was pleased on the front wall to see the, uh, a sign that said, we have four objectives, to honor God in all we do, to help people develop, to pursue excellence, and to grow profitably. But it isn't the same. What can we learn from this stunning and rapid change? I offer two uh, comments. One is that what they had done was really very fragile. The second law of thermodynamics says that there is a general deterioration unless you maintain it. And they had worked hard at maintaining this. It depended on managers leading with the tension of valuing workers and honoring God, of doing it because it was the right thing and not just because it brought good results. As a scientist, I think of this as a science experiment. When one variable changed in the way Service Master was run, 
and everything began to look different. You have to reflect and say that variable was very important. When new leadership saw that the things that they had been done before didn't give a short-term gain, an immediate concern, or when there was a turbulent time, they didn't have the courage to stay the course. A more positive result though that I've learned from this can be seen in the lives of the leaders. Many of the early leaders who had been developed in this early environment have gone on to other positions. And I found people all over the world who were taking the principles of Service Master and applying it in the organizations they now ran. One of my favorite stories was Hassan Paharik, who I talked with in Saudi Arabia. He had been running Saudi Arabia around the Middle East. And he had left the company in 1999 for very different reasons. But he told me, he said, I now run three companies in Saudi Arabia. And let me tell you about our four objectives, to honor God in all we do, to help people develop, to pursue excellence and to grow profitably. He told about his time coming to Service Master when he was so taken by what was being done that it changed his life. And he said, applying these pr principles in business and in other places, even in our lives, has made all the difference in the world. So this lives on, even if not at Service Master in the same way. But I'd like to reflect on another thing about this story. It gives us a clue as to what we do as business comes out of the COVID time. Because I think some of the experiences that we have learned during COVID, during this pandemic, have caused us to think about organizations a bit differently. And I think they align more with what Service Master was doing and more with these principles that God had put in place many years ago. And they come together as a goal of maybe thinking about what is post COVID business look like. Let me identify five of them. Number one, essential workers. One thing we've learned during the pandemic is the importance of what we now call essential workers, frontline workers. I love the things I've read about the National Health Service celebrating frontline essential workers. Service Master had shown the importance of this going back into the 1940s. As Christians, we know we do this because people are worthy of respect, but it's not a management technique. It must be applied personally. Wayne Alderson, the one I mentioned early on in this conversation, said to me one day, if you treat people with love, dignity, and respect, they'll work harder and your organization will do better. But then he said with a smile, if you treat people with love, dignity, and respect so that they will work harder, they will see through you in an instant. It can't be a manipulation, it must be real. As Bill Pollard said, when there's alignment between the cause of the firm and the cause of its people move over because there will be extraordinary performance, but it's for the worker and not a tool of management. Second, purpose. If there's one thing you know about millennials in the workplace, it's, it's they seek a sense of purpose. So much so that according to one study I read, millennials prefer a company that would give them a chance to drive meaningful progress over one that just offers a higher paycheck. Purpose beyond making money is the key. Of course, people need fair pay, but that's not the ultimate answer. Service Master pioneered this understanding in the many years of the company. I think it's time for businesses to focus on real purpose beyond making money. Third, servant leadership. Often when you read the management literature, Robert Greenleaf is identified as the one who introduced servant leadership but Jesus did so many years before when he was talking about leadership in Matthew chapter 20. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, 
whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. This became the foundation of Service Master, this servant leadership. But Ken Hansen added a new twist to servant leadership in one of the talks he gave that I've not seen anywhere in the literature. He said, remember, all leaders are human and leaders make mistakes. So if you're gonna be a true servant leader, you have to get in the habit of seeking forgiveness from the people you trample or you when you make a mistake. He had many examples of this kind of behavior, seeking forgiveness, servant leadership. Fourth, humility. I was talking with a leader of the Apple Corporation on Saturday, and she said a big learning for them during this pandemic has been humility. I was surprised to hear her say that, but she said, we're working in a larger system where we are recognize that we need each other. We're just a part of a lot of other things going on. No one knows everything. So this idea of recognizing I can learn from others, and that was deeply embedded in what Service Master did. In every way, leaders being willing to do difficult tasks just because they were not, that was not below them. James Heskett, in one of his case studies in Service Master, commented on this area through an example. He was in the boardroom while working on his case study and observed that Bill Pollard, the chairman, had spilled coffee on the floor. He asked for some cleaning supplies and got down on his hands and knees to clean up the mess. Heskett said in his report, I don't know which was more surprising, that he did this or that no one seemed to think it was unusual. You see, humility was an embedded part of what they did. Finally, helping others develop. One of the losses in business over the last 25 to 30 years, in the growth of business, there's been an escalating separation between the haves and the have nots. A recent book I read on this topic by Michael Sandel called The Tyranny of Merit reminds us of this. And Paul reminds us of this in his letter to the Corinthians. In chapter four of First Corinthians verse seven, he says, what do you have that you have not received? And if you received it, why then do you boast? Through the pandemic, we've learned a lot about supporting others. We've been in this together. And the model for a service master in its first two objectives seems to me to be something of great value and it ought to characterize us as we come out. So I've mentioned five things, essential workers, purpose beyond making money, servant leadership, humility, and helping people develop. I hope we don't go back to normal. I hope we learn from the pandemic and that we learn from service master and we learn from the scripture and as believers, I hope we will learn to apply what we have learned from scripture in the work that we do. These things were important and they were shown important, but they can continue to be important. And when you think about it, it's not just business. Any organization can benefit from this. Education, medicine, the church, the government, they would benefit from thinking about these practices as well. And you can apply them not just if you're the owner, but at every level of the organization. Looking carefully at Service Master, we can see not only what they did, but how they did it. And I trust it won't just be a historical example, but a model for us as we think ahead. Thanks very much for the time. I've really enjoyed talking with you about this story. Bravo, thank you. Thank you so much, Al. Uh, a great deal in there and um, I do commend the book to you, uh, The Service Master Story. There's a lot of uh, very helpful lessons in that. But now, Al, um, the British are going to grill you. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe some people from overseas too. Tim, over to you for some uh, Q&A. 
Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Al, for all that you shared. Really fascinating and insightful. Um, we've got a few good questions coming in. And for anyone who hasn't uh, had the chance to submit a question, then again, please head to menti.com on your phone. Um, you can find the sign up page is open, but if you scroll down to the bottom and tap open Q&A, then there's still time to upvote some of the questions that have come in and submit your own as well. But Al, the first one for you that actually has got twice as many votes as the next most popular question. So we'll start here and uh, feel free to take as long as you need to answer it. Can you speak a bit more about how the company uh, Service Master went about changing the culture in the businesses that they went on to acquire? Yeah, uh, that was that was a really challenging feat. Anyone who has known that acquisitions um, acquisitions are difficult. Um, I remember talking to John Reed, the former chairman at Citigroup, when they took on Travelers Insurance as an acquisition, and he said, I've concluded that acquisitions just don't work. Uh, he said, the cultures can be so different. So what they did was relentlessly review this material. Bill, at every opportunity, would talk about it. They would make it a part of their performance reviews. They would make it a part of their objectives. They would talk about it in decision-making processes. And he said, we didn't win everyone, but we won a lot of people because that what they began to see is this connected with who they were. You see, what Bill believed is that these principles are what it means to be made in the image of God. And so if you can connect with people as to who they really are, it can give them the permission to say, this is the way business could actually operate. And then relentlessly demonstrating it. And then that factor that Ken Hansen said about asking forgiveness. I There are a lot of stories in the books about Bill Pollard overstepping his bounds and then saying, I need to call time out. I made a mistake. I did wrong or Marion Wade doing the same, or Ken Westner doing the same, because you see, we are human and we cannot expect perfection. And so uh, it was a relentless teaching, but I have observed that as the company came apart, the early acquisitions stayed the longest and those that were latest went early, went first. And I think what happened there is that it took a time to uh, to become a part of the organization. And uh, I think a longer study on this just from the point of acquisitions would say that it's really difficult to make that work and you have to give yourself wholly to it. Uh, I've often thought that acquisitions are much like the biological action of a heart transplant you have to kind of suppress the natural immune system around you in order to have the body not reject the heart. But when you do, you're vulnerable to all sorts of diseases. And so this nurturing of the new culture and making it work uh, is something that is a relentless goal of the leader. Uh, sadly, people after Carlos and uh, Bill were not didn't believe in it enough themselves and didn't give themselves to it and probably concluded this doesn't work, but it only works with relentless attention. I hope that helps. That's great. Thanks, Al. I'll move on to the next question, which is about the four values you mentioned earlier. So perhaps you could just recap those for those of us that didn't get a chance to write them down in time. But the question is, um, can you give an example of a time where those four values were in tension with one another and perhaps a creative solution that had to be discovered as a result? Yes. Uh, so uh, the four values to honor God and all we do to help people develop, to pursue excellence and to grow profitably. There was a time when uh, in one of the, uh, working with one of the customers, the conversation was <clears throat> the work was not excellent. And the tendency would be for the leader to be very defensive and say, 
but we did everything the contract required. Instead, the leader said, I want to hear what you said, and I want to make it right. And of course, that was in conflict with profitability because they had to spend money. And of course, they had to bring a person along in order to make that work. But they committed to do that and carry that forward. Another time, uh, they entered into a partnership. This was early on with a department store to do rug cleaning. And the department store, unbeknownst to them, would took on rug cleaning themselves and set up a competitive division within the, within the department store. So the idea was that there were joint referrals, but in fact, all of their work ended up in the department store. What did they do? Marion Wade at the time found out about it when a customer complained about shoddy work and he realized the department store was doing the work. <laughs> he did a surprising thing. He went to the department store and he said, this isn't right. But I know that we have this agreement. We're going to stick with it for the next six months. Then we're going to leave. I didn't want to leave them in a lurch, he said, honoring the people. You would say that's probably really naive. But Marion Wade concluded, no, it was the right thing to do. And I'm going to honor these people, even if they didn't honor me. And in the end, he said, our business grew. He said, sometimes when you honor others, you're going to be taken. He said, that's okay. Remember, you're serving the living God. It will get taken care of. Hold on to the honor. <laughs> that's great. Thanks, Al. Uh, very challenging. I think those yes. are the, even though that's, uh, yeah, it's a context that not many of us can relate to, but it's a principle that all of us have to live with day to day so yeah yeah thanks for that and uh, of course question? oh sorry yeah, add yeah well of course paying an individual more and what happens to profit uh treating a person well even when they messed up and losing something i mean you keep playing this over and over and over again and they're always going to be intention and so this idea of holding them together intentionally is is really the key mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And it reminds me of the illustration of the exercise band as well. Yeah. Holding those in tension and creative tension, definitely, and not letting go. Um, there's a question that's come in uh, <laughs> that uh, has picked up a few votes, which is about when Bill Pollard started out and did his cleaning job for the first few weeks of his role. Um, and the question is, did Bill also receive a cleaner's salary when he was doing that job? And um, yeah, I, and how did that affect the wider culture and uh, whether he, according to what he was paid or not? Well, what he told me was, no, he didn't receive a cleaner salary. He got the salary that he was given. But he also told me that he had another job to do, which was related to being executive vice president. And he had to do that in the evening. So he put in the eight hours on the job and then he put in another six to eight hours in doing his real job. And so he was effectively doing, uh, doing two jobs. Um, they, they turned this into a, a, a program of sorts where every person that came into management, uh, particularly those hired from outside, uh, had to do this work. And every one of them shape, said this shaped the way they did things. If I could share just another brief story uh, Dave Aldridge was hired with an MBA and his first assignment was scrubbing baseboards in the new wing of a hospital. And he, he said, as I was scrubbing these baseboards, two nurses walked in and I looked up and said, hello. And they completely ignored me as if I was a part of the furniture. And he said, I wanted to say to them, hey, I have an MBA. My wife is a nurse. And it was like he was ignored. He said that shaped every bit of my management to realize how a service person feels invisible. So it was done primarily uh, for helping leaders learn the practice. Um, but um, you're right, the other dimension would be possible and maybe one of you and your company will, will implement that as well. <laughs> I look forward to it in LRCC when we get back in the building.
Paul Woolley hasn't been physically present with us yet, but there's plenty of time for him to establish himself. <laughs> okay, another question. Uh, so, Al, do you think it's possible to build kingdom culture in a company where the leadership is already established and seem to be seeking money and profit rather than God? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the leadership is already established and if they're not open to this. Um, what happened with many of these companies was um, this relentless pursuit of an understanding. Someone from the lawn care business told me that Bill Pollard was relentless in talking with him about that. But one of the things that affected him was at one time when they had a meeting, Bill asked about his child who had been sick. And it just never occurred to him that a manager, a leader would actually care about him as a person. And he said it broke him down. Just, uh, it, just a little element to say, I care about the whole person. And so I think it takes time. And I think sometimes, and Bill acknowledged this, sometimes it was necessary to replace a leader because it was all about them. And he said, one of the challenging things in this kind of leadership, how do you fire someone? He said, one, of the, one person that I uh, interviewed said, he was interviewing for a senior position and one of Bill's first questions to him was, how would you fire someone? And he said, I thought you didn't fire people because you were nice to people. And he said, well, being nice to people is not the same as not firing them because if they're unsuited for the position, they shouldn't be there. They will affect themselves and others. So how do you do it in such a way that it respects their dignity, respects who they are as a person, and yet you have to do the right thing by the organization? <laughs> There's another tension, isn't there? And uh, that's a part of it. That's great, thanks. You said the final two values in Service Master were seen as a means to achieve the first two. So someone's asked uh, with a few upvotes, can you explain a little more about how those latter two values supported the first goal of honoring God particularly? Sure, let me give you the primary example. Um, if you are not growing profitably, you can't grow. If you don't grow, you don't create opportunity for people to develop. How does the company promote 20% of its workers into leadership if the company is not growing? Um, another person made this analogy, which I think might be helpful. He said, it isn't that profit is unimportant, but he said, blood is like your profit. You can't live without it, but it's not your reason for living. You don't get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, wow, I have great blood today, but you can't live without that. And so it is with a business. The profit is absolutely essential and growing that profit grows opportunities for people. So it's the means by which people have opportunity. It's the means by which the company can serve other customers, but it's not an end in itself. I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, th there are many other illustrations of this, but there's one. That's great. Thanks. I wonder, uh, could you point us to any resources that would unpack that anymore in terms of how do we seek the honor of God through the work that we do, through the business and organization of the work that we do? What's helped you? Yeah. Um, you know, the, um, for, uh, for three years, I researched this, uh, this book, interviewing people, reading articles, incorporating things. And there was a lot of stories in the book. And I think that's one resource. But then there are some earlier books. Uh, Marion Wade wrote a wonderful little book called The Lord is My Counsel that does, uh, covers the early years. Uh, Bill Pollard wrote a book called The Soul of the Firm, which uncovers some of these things. Many of those I tried to incorporate but there are stories there that I couldn't include. And then of course, um, if you really want to go in depth, <laughs> uh, Bill Pollard donated 24 volumes of speeches that he gave over many years to the Seattle Pacific University uh, Library. And many of these were digitized and are available in the library. So you can read speeches he gave all over the world 
uh, that incorporated how he thought about some of these things. And those were, were sources, of course, for uh, some of the work that I've done. And then there are many other things as well. So um, Mark's book, uh, Fruitfulness on the Front Line, is a great resource for kind of thinking about what it means to actually live this out in a way that, uh, that honors God and so many other resources. Uh, but those are a few. That's a great place to leave it. Thanks so much, Al. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions and voted. Sorry we didn't get a chance to get through all of them, but hopefully that's given you a good insight and a new angle on all that Al had to share. Back to Mark. Well, thank you very much indeed, Al. That was uh, really marvellous and uh, very, very moving in many parts, I have to say. Just want to say that it, uh, you need to come back and write some books about some British companies uh, that are operating right now. Uh, we do have some people on the call and when you were talking about honoring workers i remember going up to to burnley to a company i don't know that if i got permission to mention the name of the company but i went up there it's a, a bakery mid-sized bakery and um one of their goals uh, the the leader of that company said as perhaps you know in 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 baking lots of people don't get paid very much and a lot of people who've worked for that company were from overseas and not particularly popular in lancashire at the time <laughs> and uh, so on and he said uh, my goal is to create a sanctuary for the people who work for me and uh, one of the things about it was that the um the loos were like claridges i don't know if you've been to claridges loos but let me tell you that they're not by <laughs> st pancras um and the canteen was uh, set out with leather chairs which shows you something about his honoring and respecting um, the workers there. And it was really an amazing experience for me to see that in 21st century Britain. And, and there are indeed other examples. So you have an open invitation to come and write up all the stories. I've not <laughs> had time to put into a book, but thank you, Al, uh, very much indeed uh, for what you've brought us. Um, I think this evening you've treated us with great gentleness and kindness and humility yourself, uh, but you've presented to us quite, in a sense, quite a deep challenge, um, I think. Um, it's certainly the case, as you've observed, that we have come to respect and honor essential workers more. And I think post people and um, people who collect our garbage have never been so, so greeted and celebrated before. Sometimes I think that's just because they're the only people who come to our doors these days and that we get to talk to, yeah. but there it is. And, in terms of uh, what you've given us this evening, um, I think you've definitely fulfilled three of the Service Master goals. I feel like you've certainly honoured God in all the way that you've done this this evening. You have sought to develop us in the most gentle and kind but firm way. Uh, you've done it excellently, thank you. I don't think we're going to be able to increase your profitability very much. <laughs> I will certainly seek to honour you in that. I don't know if you have um, anything, that, last observation, but normally I would uh, ask everyone to clap at this point. So we can do that in a kind of zoomy way uh, and say thank you to you. Um, but I invite you to, thank you so much, Al, that was absolutely marvellous. Um, I invite you, if you have another final observation, and I've, I've asked Ruth Walker, who's been our champion, has been a champion for workplace ministry in Scotland for many years and has been our champion for um, transforming work and groups of front to close in prayer. But uh, do you have a, a last thought to offer Europe? Yeah, let, let me make uh, just a couple observations. This morning I was reading in Joshua about the children of Israel going into the promised land and they were told to take stones of remembrance to remember what had happened before. And I view this as a stone of remembrance of what Service Master had done, not as something to be worshiped, but as something to remind us of God's faithfulness and what it means to live that way. And one other thing I'll mention, some of you have probably heard of the Wade Center at Wheaton College. It's about C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and other things. It has very little to do, although there is a corner focusing on Service Master. But this was because Marion Wade and Ken Hansen and the others were more than workers. They loved literature, they loved C.S. Lewis, and they set up this Wade uh, Center to honor that. And I know that's, of course, tied to uh, your land. And I've been reading a lot of C.S. Lewis myself. And I just wanted to say that these were whole people, not just workers. 
And I hope that's a, a good reminder. Thanks. Thank you. Ruth, would you close our evening in prayer for us? Thank you. So Father God, we thank you for what we've learned tonight. We thank you for Al and the way he has illuminated what Service Master did and how they functioned and how it developed. But more than that, Father, we thank you for the way that he has illuminated how it is possible to live and work as whole life disciples. Father, on this call, we represent many different industries and we represent many different businesses and organisations in health and education, research and development, economic development, law, double glazing, our um, church and teaching and finance and our voluntary capacity. And Father, we hold all these uh, industries and organizations out before you and we ask for your blessing in them. Father, you've placed us there with a purpose and so I pray that we will pick up that gauntlet for you there and that we will see what you call us to. Father, thank you that when we are there, we can honor the people who work there, those who are made in your image. Father, help us to see the people we work with as people made in your image, as we bear your image to them. Father, I pray that we will help people flourish and in flourishing, they will be all that they can be and that they will discover the great creator who has made them that way. Father, I pray that we may flourish in our work, knowing that you take pleasure in us as uh, people that you have created, as people you have uh, made creative. And Father, I pray that we would hold right in front of us as we work, that we serve you, the living God. And whatever we do, whatever we do, that we work at it with all our heart because it is you that we're serving. Help us not to lose sight of that. And so, Father, I pray for each of us that we will give ourselves wholeheartedly to you, that we will um, see what you've called us to, that we will hold that um, carefully and in a way that honours you and with a sense of the honour that you place in us by allowing us to do that. And Father, we commit ourselves to be whole life disciples wherever you have put us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.